Hello, I was thinking about uh, what I left off with with the last video. Um, and if you recall, we, I mentioned that I was able to force uh, K4, I'll say this is K4. This is just a very crude, simplified uh, diagram uh, to switch, to make a change when I apply 24 volts to all uh, three commons, K3 to K5 at the same time. Essentially what that was doing is when I had uh, all three lines tied together, uh, I was basically putting all these coaxial switches uh, in the relay circuitry in, in parallel with each other. Uh, I did a, some quick math on that. And with those two mega ohm resistors, or sorry, two mega ohm coils, and forgive me, uh, my kids are playing in the background. Uh, if I calculated out the total resistance of, of the parallel circuit with those two mega ohm coils, uh, the resistance is actually 666 uh, decimal six repeating uh, kilo ohms. Uh, so we'll just say it's approximately uh, 600 and 667 kilo ohms to actually have all four, uh, all three of these coaxial switches uh, and the relays wired up in parallel. And so I, I did a little bit more math. Uh, plug in this value with 24 volts uh, into Ohm's law and uh, Come to find out our, our milliamps, you know, it's, it's, it's slightly increased um, but we're seeing uh, a milliamp so 0 0.0354 we're, we're, we're seeing that you can have the potential to draw 0 0.0354 milliamps, okay? Now the the coaxial switches are only going to draw as much current as what's needed in order for them to engage. However, <clears throat> uh, that's still below the threshold of 75 milliamps that the the uh, the actuator the uh, the contacts can sustain inside of here. So it still would be perfectly safe to wire them up in in parallel. However, I started wondering, well, why is this? Uh, why are they failing? Uh, you know not directly out of the box when they're brand new, but uh, you know, with just a little bit of age. And I started thinking about, well, what are some ways that a uh, relay is improved? And that brought me to thinking about uh, flyback voltage. So typically, ignore what I've driven, drawn in here for now, but uh, a coil uh, has a time coefficient in which, uh, you know, the voltage applied is going to eventually equal out across the coil. So when 24 volts DC is applied down the common side, uh, there's a specific amount of time that this coil has to reach that 24 volts VDC uh, <clears throat> in order for this uh, magnetic uh, electromagnetic field to start generating. You know, current's got to come. It's going to be drawn through the coil as well. Uh, but the minute that, and since this is a latching relay, we know that in order to induce a separate state, uh, a change, the when we remove the ground from here and put it onto terminal two, uh, that's the only way to make the change with your your contacts here for the uh, the output. Otherwise, it remains the same. But what happens is, as soon as you no more, you no longer have that uh, that ground applied to here. Uh, the coil itself, the 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 polarity of it immediately in reverses, okay? And when it does that, so that way it can get rid of the potential across coil uh, and, and go back to uh, a state pre-24 um, volts, right? Um, <clears throat> the amount of time that it takes to dissipate that is no different than the amount of time of the coefficient that it will equal out to the 24 volts VDC applied. However, during that period in time when the polarity changes, uh, the voltage across that coil is going to have an instantaneous uh, uh, accumulation. Like it's going to spike. It's it's going it maybe even potentially double. I mean, so when that occurs, that uh, instantaneous spike in voltage uh, could be what's causing damage to your your contacts. Right? There's several contacts. Uh, especially because you have indicators, you got a contact here. Um, but basically, when these these could be damaged, so that could be one reason why 
uh, it's not switching over after a little bit of age uh, because of that flyback voltage. The way to overcome that is by putting like a one in uh, four double oh seven uh, diode in line with the coil. Now I, we, I can't break open the uh, the coaxial relays themselves or coaxial switches because they have a sealant that would ruin them. But what this diode would do is it would allow for the the dissipation, if I could put it that way, of um, of uh, the potential here without the buildup of of without the buildup of voltage, I believe. Um, so I think that that's one reason why it's potentially failing. And again, I also think that you know having such a high resistant coil is not really needed uh, either, to be honest. Uh, which was proven because yet when we did tie all the commas together, we put it in parallel that drops the the total resistance of the circuit. Uh, and you know, my milliamps is is still relatively low. Uh, it's not consuming you know a whole lot of power to be honest. 0 0.86 milliwatts. Uh, <clears throat> so you know, however, when I did. Uh, tie all three commons together, you know, they, they can no longer act independently of each other, right? Because they're all now in, in parallel, right? That that voltage potential hill here is going to be felt here and here if I was when they were all tied together, right? So, however, at the Mullet's connector, they're actually all separate, right? So, and I think I previously stated this, that might be because they were intended to be able to switch over separately. However, I, I, I highly doubt that. I think that's just the way um, this was wired up. Okay, so I want to believe that, um, you know, with the 24 volts, uh, say this is not able to, it is applied to these relays, right? And, and if it's not happening at, at the same instance in time, that we could have an issue. Uh, you know, I think that the coils themselves are not able to dissipate their potential. And because some of these relays are going ahead and making a the change, then that magnetic field, field, regardless of them having an independent 24 volt DC line to the Mullet's con connector, is still being felt across all three uh, coaxial switches, which is why K4 will hang up. Um, K3 was a little bit finicky at times, but you know, You'll see when I swap over K4 in the next video. I'm sorry it's going to be a little disjointed because I'm doing this a little out of order. That uh, that that was no longer an issue, and then this one no longer had an issue as well. Uh, however, you know I'm going I'm going to submit a modification. Uh, you know one of two to overcome this issue so we can keep these relays in stock uh, or the relay harnesses and. In place without having to order another three thousand uh, dollar harness, right? Um, and so I'm going to offer up two solutions. One, either where wherein we wire the um, coaxial switches in parallel with each other, and we would get rid of two of these uh, wires going to the Molex connector and just tie all the commons through here. Or we keep them independently wired, but we need to find a way to still allow. Um, uh, current to be felt across commons, right? Uh, and the way to do that, if you look down here, is we can use the same 1 in 4007 uh, diode in line with the 320 ohm resistor. So we have like a quasi parallel circuit right, right through here. Uh, now this is the same, imagine this being the same commons up here. And what will occur, and you'll see it here in the next video when I test this out, is when uh, 24 volts VDC is applied through here, uh, it will also come across this diode this direction, you know, anode to cathode and out. Now the 24 volts VDC applied to Charlie will not be able to go across this way because of the diode. Uh, when that 24 volts DC is present at K3, uh, it will come through the diode. There will be a voltage drop through this 320 ohm resistor. You'll see uh, 12 uh, VDC here, uh, and the same thing here. Uh, you will. I plugged it into Ohm's law, 
320 ohms, 24 volts DC, you get 75 milliamps, right? And we know that that's the max amperage. Now, it's not going to actually pull that much current, um, but it has the potential to. But we we do know that much that much amperage is more than it is right there at the limit of what um, these contacts, the armatures, the actuator, whatever can can sustain without damage. Um, but the amount of power consumption is 1.8 watts. So you would need a 320 ohm resistor, uh, minimum two watts. Uh, typically you would double it uh, for four watts so he can dissipate, you know, it's gonna be a bigger resistor. They don't really make, I couldn't find too many 320 ohm four watt resistors online, but I was able to find a 330 ohm three watt resistor um, that was pretty common. And so you can see that with a 330 ohm uh, three watt, uh, resistor or 330 ohms yeah, we could still safely use a, a three watt resistor in my opinion uh, the, the potential for the amount of current that can be drawn from that circuit is 72 milliamps so that's gives me a little bit lower but like I said it's, it's still not gonna draw that much current but this this configuration as you'll see tested in a minute will allow you to still independently operate uh, each coaxial switch each each relay circuitry within the switch but also, uh, yeah, it'll still allow you to independently operate it, um, but still overcome that, that issue where you will have a stuck relay. Um, so this is just an opening to this. Um, in, in the next video, you'll see me test this out, and then we'll get into the remove and replace of the entire uh, K4 coaxial uh, switch assembly. I believe we had to overcome a flyback voltage, and you could do that via putting uh, these one in four 007 relays across the coil itself. But you could also use them with what we previously tested. Well, like I mentioned, I, I didn't like the fact that when I applied 24 volts VDC to the common here, it also uh, created a condition in which K5 and K3 would also energize and. Uh, and uh, actuate. So what I did was I I mocked up uh, the two bad relays that I had with uh, with the one good relay. Uh, no different than what it would be in a wiring harness. Here goes uh, you know post uh, post one and and post two. The uh, commons for all all three relays are completely separate, minus the fact that I included a uh, 1N4007 diode from the common on K3. Again, ignore the sticker. Um, going to a uh, sliding potentiometer that I pulled from a, uh, an amplifier. Um, this sliding potentiometer I set for uh, 320 ohms. Now, the, primarily the reason why I did this is because I wanted to cut the voltage uh, in half but uh, to say the least I, I want to demonstrate for you what exactly this has done for us now <clears throat> with the setup here this will work the same across C1 or C2 so uh, you know this is just one half of the relay right remember there's another coil in here from what we saw from the data sheet but for our baseline I want us to go ahead and uh, I'll go ahead and take a measurement to make sure that all the relays are at a at the same uh, st uh, at at the same condition. So relay K3 is at J1 to J4, J2 to J3. So is K4, and so is K5. Now I'll turn that sound off for a second. And I want to go ahead and measure, uh, and hopefully you see this, across these uh, sliding potentiometers. Now I've been playing with this a little bit, so I might have to adjust them out again, but essentially you should see uh, around 320 ohms of resistance. And you do around that one, and you can see that this sliding potentiometer is around 300. 20 ohms of resistance of, as well. Okay, so again, I do want to say you do need a resistor 
and, and strongly encourage that you do need a resistor that's going to uh, dissipate the heat in a white uh, without uh, burning up over a long time. All right, now we're going to swap uh, back over J K4 from J1, J2 to J1, J4 to get it back to its original uh, condition. And it's just clicked back over. And it's in J1, J4. Uh, again, they should all be J1, J4. And if you remember, none of them swapped over. All right, so now let's check K3. Okay. Again, we're tied to post one. This should be J1, J4. And it is. So, same thing. Let's swap it over. All right, we heard it physically make that change. Let's see if it did make that change. And it has, it's on J1, J2. Did K4 swap over as well? It shouldn't have. Nope. K4 is still on J1, J4, which is good. What about K5? K5 is still on J1, J4, which is good. All right. So let's put it back to its original state. And it should have swapped back over to J1, J4. And it has. So, if I am going to submit this, I am going to ask that they uh, for this change to save the life of these relays so that they're not getting stuck anymore i'm going to ask that we modify by including a one in four double oh seven diode between the common rails of k3 to k4 and common rails of k5 uh, k4 to k5 and then right after each diode we'll have a 320 ohm resistor rated for somewhere between two to four watts So what I've done is I went ahead and put a little bit of uh, 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 rosin solder flux on it. And I'm going to go ahead and take my uh, lead-based solder and put some on the tip of my soldering iron. Okay. Now, in order to take this off, uh, what I've also done, now it's not as important for the uh, where your 24 volts comes into because remember in our diagram that isn't jumpered over onto uh, the other relays it, that, that, that line uh, is, is independent but the other ones are okay now remember I said that there's probably glue in here keeping this thing that could be another reason why you can't apply that heat for very long but what I'm going to have to do for the other wire since they are jumpered to each other is you see I have gator clips, I've got them on, on both, and I'm just doing this as a demonstration. I have to do it for every single wire. But I want to be able to dissipate the heat that could come down the wire uh, to the other relays. And that's what these clips will do. Uh, if there's any heat that comes through the wire itself, uh, these clips here will uh, basically act like a load to that heat, keeping it from... Uh, burning up the other terminal points or creating an issue. So the reason why I am adding more solder and, and uh, to this post and adding flux is because that should make it easier to just pop the wire off of it. I, I would hope. I think that would work for what we are doing here. Um, and if I can pull uh, heat up this wire and pull it off 
uh, under five seconds. Now I might have to just add the solder on first, let it cool down, and then go back in for five seconds, heat up, and remove this wire. Um, the wire is not wrapped fully around the entire post. Um, it's basically uh, hooked around it like that. Okay, you'll notice I have the first wire off. I was misreading it. So yeah, your max temp is 210 degrees Celsius, but it doesn't mean that uh, basically that's the max temp of the post. So that four second time is that you can only hold that uh, soldering iron there for four seconds. What it is is this post cannot be at that temperature for four, for longer than uh, four seconds, right? Four seconds? Uh, five seconds, sorry. Um, because it's just, when you're soldering, you have to be able to first transfer the heat and that heat could take a while to build up, right? Uh, so as soon as that solder gets to that melting point, that lead-based solder, at that point, you're probably right, you're, you will be right at the temperature in which this, uh, this SN63 uh, solder is going to melt. You've got five seconds from that point to take off what you're working on, and you have to remove the heat from there. Now, what I did is I, uh, as I added solder to my soldering iron, uh, so you'll see that there is additional solder on this post. I'll have to clean it up here in a little bit. Uh, but I put that extra solder on there, and then with uh, some uh, pliers, it, as soon as that solder, as soon as it's started to, uh, to melt, right? And you can tell a difference when you're soldering when, when it goes from a solid state to a liquid state. I pulled the wire off and I removed the heat. I'm going to have to do the same thing for these other two posts, okay? Uh, now, the reason why I'm adding solder to my soldering iron when I take this off is because that's going to create more surface area for heat to transfer, okay? So I'm not spending an incredible amount of time on this post applying heat uh, to begin with. So I've added some uh, rosin flux to the center post here. Uh, the wires are wrapped around uh, in a clockwise fashion. So if I, you were to look at it from the same angle I am, this is your wire, in the middle is your post, and it's wrapped around like that. Uh, so I have to come up on that post and pull this out. I will try to do it with these needle nose pliers, um, but if that's not going to be as easy since I have two wires there, I do have uh, some needle nose pliers. Sorry, if I, if I can't do it with these tweezers, I will try to do it with these needle nose pliers. The main thing is, is I really don't want to, to use these because they have teeth in them. And that teeth is going to create an issue for this wire, the uh, insulation on the outside. And I don't want to be breaking the, uh, the conductor, the, the wire itself inside this insulation or tearing it up because it's, uh, you know, it, it serves as a, a purpose uh, and that purpose I don't want to uh, mess up. So I'm going to add uh, some more uh, SN65 solder to my soldering iron tip. And now what I'm going to do, so it's just going to be removing each wire. That one is off. If you notice, I'm pulling away as soon as it melts. I'm pulling this away because I do not want to keep it heated beyond that melting point at uh, 410 degrees uh, Fahrenheit or 210 degrees uh, Celsius for longer than five seconds. I don't want this post itself to remain heated for longer than that period. All right. So, that next set of wires is off. Okay. Early off. All right. So,
Uh, that's five wires off. Now we need to clean this up. All right to clean this up what I did is I took a little bit of a desoldering wick uh, and I put it almost into a bow I'm going to feed this over the terminal like I said the best the best way to solder is to make things as easy as possible for you uh, so I'm going to apply that on there and when that solder starts to melt on the post I should be able to get it clean by moving it back and forth. I realized as I was working on this, there's no need for me to clean up these terminal posts. Additionally, uh, this one's the one that was coming out, so I actually had to desolder uh, all three of these. But I decided because, you know, who I am, I, I don't like taking out something at least getting it cleaned up. Um, after I desoldered all the water wires, um, I went ahead and started cleaning up the posts and removing the excess, uh, the excess solder. And I'm going to uh, zoom in for a minute and show you something. So here's one that I haven't cleaned up yet. Uh, you can see that there is a substantial amount of uh, lead solder left on it. But here is one I did clean up. Now there's something really uh, peculiar about this post. If you look at the top of it, there's actually a wire that runs through post and then down and wrapped around. I was looking at it, I was like, well, none of my wires broke off when I was taking them off. Uh, I know that. So maybe that's the reason why there's such a tight tolerance on how long you can apply the heat is more than likely this wire is running through post and then out the post on the other side to something else. It's not, and that's what's making the physical connection is from here uh, down to whatever it's going to. And, by, and if you have this, uh, this post heated up for too long, because you have a wire that runs through it, uh, maybe uh, the solder at the other end of the wire uh, could potentially, it could turn into a state of liquid and uh, versus a solid and potentially uh, desolder itself from the other end is basically what I'm trying to say. So what I've done is I went ahead and uh, desoldered all the wires. I cleaned up the first three posts and then I stopped because I started looking at that and I was like, hmm, well that's interesting. Um, I'm going to set that aside. I want to draw for you what I'm looking for when I solder to these posts. Now remember our data sheet said no more than 210 degrees Celsius. The post cannot be heated greater than 210 degrees Celsius. So I got my soldering iron set to 410 Fahrenheit with it. I just put 210 in little app on my phone and convert it over. Um, the, you have to use SN63, it's a lead tin based solder. Uh, and then once that post is up to that temp, you'll be able to tell because the solder is going to uh, start adhering to it. Uh, you can only have that post heated up for no more than five seconds. So, when you're soldering wires, either dual or single to, to a post, there's a couple things that you have to uh, take note of. First off, let's pretend like this is the, the top of that post, right? And this will be the same for a single or a double wire. Let's pretend that this is my wire 
coming in okay so and then here we'll go the uh, the uh, insulation when I solder this wire onto onto here uh, I don't need to put too much on I don't need to put too much uh, too little right so when I uh, put my soldering iron the tip to here I'm gonna have some solder on it uh, to be honest and I could feed some solder in from the other way but I want to see this right here fill in to where it's almost convex right and then the same thing will occur from here to here uh, it'll be a nice filled in area now if I was to put the post vertical say this is the top of the post here's it coming down and we'll call this the, the bottom of the post say this is one wire coming in right and then it's going to wrap around the back and then come forward right wrapping around this way uh, when I'm looking for the right amount of solder I'll also see that uh, too much is going to be bubbled right you're going to see too much but I'm going to have this filled in and I'll have this filled in here and sorry I should have that's the bottom over on this side it's going to be filled in right so there would be a nice almost like I've made a small mound uh, adhe adhesion of solder to the post itself in between these areas now too much it'll be bubbled over and you're not going to see the the tinned wire uh, it'd be mounted up too little and you'll see too much of the exposed wire so if I had too much you know it could be bubbled out this way if I had too little it wouldn't be this nice it'd be like um, say this is the wire coming through here's my post if I had too little I'd only see this small amount on the little side of the post and all this top portion of my wire would be exposed. I, I don't want that. I want it to look something akin to this. Now, when you do two wires, not only are you concerned with this bo bottom wire, but you're also concerned with uh, spacing around the post and the right amount. All right? If you want to see how I'm forming these wires around the post, as I have them pre tinned, I'm just slowly working them around uh, with my thumb. And I'm going to take my needle nose pliers. And I'm not going to crimp on them as if I'm trying to make a connection. Uh, using the crimping tool but I'm going to apply just enough pressure to, to form this how I need it formed Okay, got that one formed. And actually, pop it back off. Get this other one out that way. Put that one back on. Or I can just go ahead and form this one in the same way, too. Now, I don't want to form this off the post because I want it to, 
Like I don't want to put in needle nose pliers or something, just bend it off of the post because I could create a bend that's not uniform with the post itself. And this isn't the easiest thing to work on, mind you. Because um, you form it off the post, you create a a condition in, in which uh, you probably reduce surface area of the actual wire on the post as well. So this one formed up pretty good. I do want to make sure that I am keeping the, the right precautions, of course, concerning the temperature of uh, of my soldering iron. No more than five seconds. Uh, once heat, once the solder is liquefy once that post is up to temperature um, additionally I, I, I do take pride in my work so I don't want any I do not want to present a sloppy jalopy job especially as this is going into equipment that is important Okay, I've finished soldering in and then I cleaned up with IPA the the top of this uh, relay I've, I've soldered into here. So now it's time to actually test each individual relay again uh, and ensure that they are uh, clicking over. Right now, I believe the state they're in should all be J1 to J4. Uh, and J2 to J3. And that is the case. So, I will apply negatively to the gray-red of the Molex connector. And then touch K5, K4, K3. See if they all click over. Sounds like they have. So let's test to see if we have continuity. Here goes K5, J1, J2. Yep. J4, J3. Yep. Here goes K4. One of those giving us issues. Yep. J1, J2. J3, J4. Check K3. Yep, J1, J2, J3, J4. And we'll swap them all back one more time. Just to make sure that we are fully good. All right, K5. Clicked over, yep, and stayed over. K4, it's clicked over and stayed over. K3, it's clicked over as well. All right, and let's test again. 
J1, J4 should it should be this time. And yes it is. Yes it is. Good. And good. And we'll do this one more time from its original state. Let's do K5, K4, K3. Should be J1, J2 now. J4, J3. There it is. It is all right so this relay harness is repaired uh, hopefully you learned something on this video um, you know maybe a little bit about relays uh, maybe some soldering techniques but I thoroughly enjoyed working on this is something out of the outside of things I typically work on uh, at least in my house this isn't something that was in my home and yeah have a good day